Interested in learning about wine, but not sure where to start? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. I'm your host, Haley Bullman, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm a wine enthusiast turned wine educator and founder of the Seattle-based wine tasting business, Cork and Fizz. It is my goal to build your confidence in wine by making it approachable and lots of fun. You can expect to learn everything from how to describe your favorite wine to what to pair with dinner tonight and so much more. Whether you're a casual wine sipper or a total cork dork like myself, this podcast is for you. So grab yourself a glass and let's dive in. Welcome back. Today we are doing a new installment, right? The next installment? The next installment of my mini series of grape deep dives. Now, I don't really know why I called it a mini series. I feel like this series could last forever. There are lots of different grape varieties out there. <laughs> but anyway, we'll we'll see what happens when we get there. Today we are going to be talking about Cabernet Franc. Now, if there are other varietals that you would like me to talk about and you'd like to learn more about, go ahead and send me an email, Haley at corkandfizz.com, or find me on Instagram at corkandfizz, and let me know what wines that you want me to talk about. Diving into Cabernet Franc, you may not be incredibly familiar with this wine, but you are likely familiar with one of its offsprings, Cabernet Sauvignon. That's right. Cabernet Franc is one of the genetic parents of Cabernet Sauvignon. It's also the genetic parent of Merlot and Carmenier. Remember that grape from Chile we talked about in a previous episode that everyone thought was Merlot, but it wasn't, and now it's all planted in Chile? That's Carmenier, and Cabernet Franc is one of its parents. The interesting thing is that these three grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Carmenere, were created when Cabernet Sauvignon was planted in Bordeaux, France. But that is not where the grapevine originated. In fact, Cabernet Franc originated in the Basque country, which is an autonomous country. Basically means it has its own like politics and administration. They also have their own language, but it was planted in or originated in the Basque country, which is located in northern Spain. However, there is a little bit of debate. I feel like, I swear, every one of these grape varietals, there is like a debate on where it's actually from. People really want to be able to say that it originated in their country. But there's a debate for Cabernet Franc on whether this grape came from the French or Spanish side of the Basque country. Technically, some of the Basque country crosses over the Spanish-French border. but I'm honestly not too concerned about that, and I don't think you are either. So it came from the Basque country. That's where Cabernet Franc originated. So Cabernet Franc started in the Basque country, and then it was planted in Bordeaux, France, where it cross-pollinated with grapes like Sauvignon Blanc to create Cabernet Sauvignon. See, that one makes sense, right? Cabernet Franc plus Sauvignon Blanc equals Cabernet Sauvignon. And then obviously cross-pollinated with some other grapes to produce the other two, Merlot and Carmenere, along with, I'm sure, a few others. From there, the grapes were brought up to the Loire Valley and planted at the Abbey of Bourgueil. However, in the Loire Valley, Cabernet Franc was called Breton for the longest time, and many people believe this is because they were cared for at the Abbey by an abbot named Breton. In the Loire Valley, this is where Cabernet Franc truly found its home. And we'll talk about that a little later when I highlight my favorite regions for this grape. But it's interesting to know that, like, I think this is its true homeland, but it didn't originate here. Now, of course, Cabernet Franc has been taken all across the world beyond France. You can find it in Italy. You can find it in the U.S. I believe it's also down in South Africa. And I wouldn't be surprised if you could find it um, in Australia and New Zealand as well. Okay, so that's your history of Cabernet Franc. Let's talk a little bit more about the details of this grape. As I mentioned earlier, it is a very important grape, but not necessarily well known. Its offspring tend to be a little more famous, but that's okay because it just means more for those of us who do know about it. The grape itself is fairly easy ripening and very robust. This makes it the perfect blending grape as it can add great fruit flavor to other grapes that 
didn't have as great of a growing year. With being easy ripening, that means that the acids that are naturally found in the grape easily ripen and produce a little more sugar. And this leads to a little bit of a sweeter flavor, or not sweeter flavor, I should say, but more fruit flavor in your wine. And then it lowers the acidity level. So if grapes aren't ripening very well, you're going to end up with a lot of acidity in your wine. And by being robust, it means it can withstand a lot of the weather conditions that other grapes might not be able to. Now, if you've ever heard of a Bordeaux blend, Cabernet Franc is almost always included in this blend, not usually as a large percentage, but even a small amount of it can help bring up the fruitiness and just flavors, positive flavors in the wine. Cabernet Franc produces a diversity of tastes, and I think this is what makes it so fun. It was once believed to be best in cooler climates, but now you'll see Cabernet Franc grown in just about any climate. With cooler climates, it produces a wine with a more tart fruit flavor, more herbal and green notes, along with higher acidity and lower alcohol. A warmer climate basically means that the grapes have ripened more, produces a wine with sweeter fruit flavors. Doesn't mean the wine is sweet, just sweeter fruit flavors. I want to make sure we're being sure on that. Less green notes and more alcohol. Now, speaking of those green notes, let's dive a little deeper into those. Cabernet Franc is most well known for these green flavors. It even passes these flavors on to its predecessors like Cabernet Sauvignon and Carmenere. These green flavors come from a chemical compound called methoxypyrazines. So methoxypyrazines, or pyrazines for short, are a specific chemical compound and they create savory aromas like bell pepper, spicy or sweet herbs, jalapeno, or even just this rustic earth aroma and flavor. Now, typically an overabundance of pyrazines, those were kind of like the good flavors that pyrazines can produce. If you have an overabundance of pyrazines, this will lead to unpleasant aromas of old asparagus water. I don't know if you ever had that lying around. (laughs) Or mushy steamed green pepper, which does not sound appetizing (laughs) in any way. The aroma compounds actually occur naturally in the vines, and they were developed as a way for the plant to protect itself from pests, basically a natural pest deterrent. There is a way to control the amount of pyrazines in your wine, However, it needs to be done in the vineyard. Once you harvest those grapes, there's not a whole lot of winemaking you can do to change the levels of pyrazine. So you're going to do a lot of the work in the vineyard. So a good reminder, again, remember, wine is a product that's made from grapes, and those grapes have to be farmed. So our farmers are very, very important. Vineyard practices that can lead to high levels of pyrazines include overwatering, a bushy canopy, essentially too many leaves, and then grape cluster shading during the first 50 days of fruit set. If that made no sense, just know that it means not enough sunlight early on. You can avoid high levels of pyrazines by clearing the fruit zone. This essentially means allowing more sunlight in to get into the each of the grapes. So you're going to prune the grapes a little bit. This is where they go around and actually cut clusters of grapes off of the vines and just let them drop to the ground. You can also keep the canopy. So this is the leaves that end up kind of over the vines. It might not always look like a true canopy like you could walk under, but they act as a canopy for the grapes. So if you keep that in good order, basically removing more of the leaves to allow more sunlight to come in, but not too much because you don't want to sunburn your grapes. That is actually a thing that can happen. The other thing you can do to avoid high levels of pyrazines is to restrict the amount of water that the vines get. Now, choosing where to plant and when to harvest is also very important here. So even just before the farming aspect, choosing where you're going to plant the grapes is something you need to keep in mind. So these grapes need lots of sunshine, and they also need a safe spot to harvest later if they want to ripen them a little bit more. So with lots of sunshine, hillsides are great for this. And in terms of a safe spot to harvest later, that's going to be more about the climate of the region, right? So you're not going to want to have a lot of rainfall at harvest or for the temperatures to drop consistently at harvest time. 
Now, the green notes in wine began as a positive thing. People sought out this high acidity and these fresh notes, and this was especially in Loire Valley Cabernet Francs. Remember, that was the region where the wine started in the Basque country, went to Bordeaux, and then went up to the Loire Valley in France. So this was a sought-after flavor. People really enjoyed it. But then California started making Cabernet Franc, and it was more fruit-forward. They really kind of minimized these green flavors, and there was higher alcohol. And consumers started to prefer that. After that point, that greenness was almost considered a flaw, those green flavors. Now I feel like we're going in the opposite direction, or maybe it's just kind of like a cycle or a circle. (laughs) But consumers and producers are moving away from the overripe, lots of fruit flavor and higher alcohol style wines. And there's more of an interest in natural, organic, biodynamic. And along with these things, comes with this desire for lower alcohol wines, letting the wine speak for itself and not getting it too overripe. So that greenness, those green flavors, the herbs, the green pepper, the earthiness, those are considered positive and it's seen as adding layers of flavor beyond the fruitiness in your wine. Now, as I mentioned briefly before, Cabernet Franc is often used as a blending grape. This means that it's blended with other grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. However, you can definitely still find it as a single varietal. A single varietal means that the wine itself is made with 100% Cabernet Franc or almost 100%. We we won't worry about that right now, but just think of single varietal equals 100% that grape, so 100% Cabernet Franc but you just have to know where to look. So here are some of my favorite wine regions where you'll either find 100% Cabernet Franc or Cabernet Franc dominant wines. And this means that more than 50% of the wine is made up of Cabernet Franc. Do you ever find yourself standing in front of the wine aisle at the grocery store feeling completely lost and overwhelmed? Don't worry, you're not alone. But what if I told you that I have a way to transform the wine aisle from overwhelming into an endless sea of joy and discovery? And it involves drinking wine and joining the most welcoming and fun community. In my Court Crew Virtual Tasting Club, we're all about exploring new and exciting wines in a fun and supportive community. No more feeling intimidated or stuck in a rut of buying the same bottle of wine. Each month, we explore two new wines, so you can broaden your palate and explore new flavors. Not only will we taste these wines together, but we'll learn about where the wines come from, essentially traveling the world all through the wine in our glass. Come join the Cork Crew, and you'll have the opportunity to taste new wines, meet winemakers and other wine professionals, and connect with like-minded wine lovers from all over the world. Imagine the joy of discovering a new favorite wine and being able to confidently choose a bottle that you know you'll love. So why not join us? Head to my website at corkandfizz.com slash the cork crew to sign up. And don't forget to use code wine101 to get your first month free. And now back to the show. All right, we're going to start with what I consider the homeland of Cabernet Franc, even if it's not where it originated, and that is the Loire Valley of France. So where in the Loire Valley will you find Cabernet Franc? You're going to want to look in a region called Terrain. This is in the central area of the Loire Valley, and more specifically, you're going to look for these sub-regions within Terrain, which include Chinon, Bourgai, which doesn't look anything like how I'm saying it. It is B O U R. G-U-E-I-L. And I'm probably not saying it right. Sorry for all the French speakers. If there are any French speakers listening, I do not speak any French. Um, And that first one, Chinon, is C-H-I-N-O-N. So it looks like Chinon? Yeah, you know, but it's Chinon. And then Bourgai, and then saint Nicolas de Bourgai. So again, kind of looking for that Bourgai. And then Samour Champigny, I believe is how you say it. So keep in mind that these wines are usually labeled by the region, so it won't say Cabernet Franc on the wine label. But trust me, if it says one of these regions, Chinon, 
Burgai, St. Nicolò de Burgai, and Samor Champigny, or even just says Terrain, which is the uh, larger region, and it's a red wine, it's going to be a Cabernet Franc. These Loire Valley Cabernet Francs, they're incredibly aromatic. They've got smooth tannins and relatively high acidity. This means they're great wines to pair with food, and they are typically meant to be drank within the first few years, though there are definitely some that are age-worthy and can age for some time. Okay, moving beyond the Loire Valley, let's talk about Bordeaux. Now, most Bordeaux wines, Bordeaux is another region in France, most of these wines are going to be Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon dominant. Again, that means if it's a the wine dominant, it means that varietal makes up more than 50%. However, you can find some that are Cabernet Franc dominant, and I feel like these are worth searching for. In general, you'll find the Cabernet Franc dominant blends on the right bank. So the Bordeaux is broken down into two regions, the right bank and the left bank. Um, and then in each of these, there are specific regions, which is what you'll actually find on the bottle. Most bottles do not say left bank or right bank on them, though that would be helpful. But you're going to look for Pomerol or saint Emilion. However, again, keep in mind that not all the wines labeled with Pomerol and saint Emilion are going to be Cabernet Franc dominant. These are kind of those uh, needle in the haystack. You're going to have to look for them a little bit more. Some wineries to look for that produce Cabernet Franc dominant blends include Chateau Cheval Blanc, Le Dome and Chateau La Flor. Again, I probably didn't pronounce those right, but hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> you can expect these wines to have a little more oomph, is like how I like to say it, than their Loire Valley counterparts. All right, now we're going to head over the ocean and head over to the U.S. This is where I've had a lot of Cabernet Franc from as well. So we're going to talk about three regions here um, in the U.S. So we're going to start with the Finger Lakes in New York. And you'll also see this uh, abbreviated to FLX, Finger Lakes in New York. This area has the perfect cool climate to produce elegant and food-friendly Cabernet Franc. Think similar to our Laura Valley. Plus, they're an excellent value. I can get most of these wines for probably 20, between 20 and $30. As it is a New World version, remember, New World is anywhere besides Europe. It's anywhere where, like, wines were brought from Europe to somewhere else. You can expect a little more fruit-forward flavor from New World wines, just in general, and then a toned-down green flavor. It's still going to be there, just not quite as strong as it was in the Loire Valley. Some of my favorite producers in the Finger Lakes region include Ravines, Dr. Constantine, Bravery Wines, and Weiss Vineyards. And Weiss is spelled W-E-I-S. All right, staying on the East Coast but heading south, another great spot to find Cabernet Franc is in Virginia. Yeah, I said Virginia. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but they make some really good wines. My favorite first wine from Virginia that I ever tried was a Cabernet Franc by Horton Vineyards, and it was amazing. It, it blew my mind. It was like the perfect Thanksgiving wine. It had all those really beautiful red fruit flavors like cranberry and pomegranate, but it also had this like herbal note like thyme, and it just like, you know, the flavors of like stuffing, but then you put cranberry sauce on it. That was what this wine <laughs> smelt and tasted like. So I really think Cabernet Franc, the grape, has made a home for itself in Virginia. One thing to keep in mind, Virginia has fairly unpredictable weather. It's difficult to grow grapes here. So the wines from this region are very dependent on vintage. Remember, vintage is the year that the grapes were harvested. So if the weather wasn't great one year, you might not have a great harvest or a great vintage. I like to warn about this just because I don't want you to try... This wine, you know, try a Cabernet Franc from a given producer in one year and not enjoy it and totally give up on it, all right? So it's just something to keep in mind that if you didn't like the one year, maybe try it the next year or even reach out to the winery or the wine shop where you brought the wine and ask them what was a good vintage for Virginia or for where that wine was made. Now, some of my favorite producers in Virginia that I'd highly recommend, and honestly, I haven't had a bad vintage yet from these guys, um, would be Early Mountain. Horton Vineyards, that's the one that produced that very first one that I tried, and Keswick Vineyards, starts with a K, K-E-S-W-I-C-K, Keswick Vineyards. And of course, I can't forget the state that I currently call home, and that is Washington State. 
This is going to be the warmest region of them all, so the most fruit-forward flavor, though there are some cooler sites. Kind of depends. If you're further east in Washington, this is going to be a warmer region. You're going to have more of that fruit-forwardness. Again, warmer regions means more sunshine on those grapes, which means the grapes get to ripen more and produce more sugar. And then when you're making the wine, that sugar is transformed into alcohol. And the more sugar you have, the more alcohol you have, and the more of that fruity flavor that you get. Some producers to look out for here in Washington include Melody Lynn Vineyards. This is one um, where they're actually in a cooler site. They're not quite as far east in Washington. And they also produce a Cabernet Franc that is Cabernet Franc Blanc or Blanc de Cabernet Franc. I'm not sure how they call it, but it's basically a white Cabernet Franc where they make the wine, but they don't put it in contact with the skins of the grape. So it ends up producing a white wine. Kind of cool, right? Other areas to look out for, Sparkman, Andrew Will, and Lobo Hills. Lobo Hills is a big favorite of mine. I visit their tasting room during my day retreats here in Woodenville, Washington. And I just really love their philosophy behind wine. It's this idea of you know, being natural, but also experimenting and trying different things while letting the wine speak for itself, which I think is super cool. Now, of course, there are plenty of other regions to find at Cabernet Franc, but these are just some of my favorites. If there's a region that you think I should try that I did not mention, please send me a message on Instagram or Facebook. You can even send me an email, Haley at corkandfizz.com. I love trying new things, so I would love it if you'd let me know if I need to try something. And if this grape was new to you or somewhat new to you, I'd highly recommend heading out and grabbing yourself a bottle to try. Just head to your local wine shop and ask them for their favorite Cabernet Franc and give it a try. Be sure to message me on Instagram to let me know what you think. Now, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. If you loved it as much as I did, I would so appreciate it if you could take a quick second to rate it and leave a review. It takes less than five minutes and it truly does make my day. I promise. I do a little happy dance every time I see one of those. (laughs) And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. I release new episodes every Wednesday. In next week's episode, I'll be interviewing Brooke Delmas Robertson. She is the head winemaker and director of wine growing at Delmas Wines in Walla Walla. On my retreat earlier this year to Walla Walla, we did a vineyard tour with Brooke and it was absolutely one of the top highlights of the trip. Brooke is so knowledgeable, but really breaks down the knowledge in an approachable way. And it was just fun to learn a little bit more about the grapevines themselves before they become the wine. She has so much knowledge to share and I'm really looking forward to chatting with her. Thanks again for listening. And if you want to learn more about wine, come follow me at Cork and Fizz on Instagram. And to try more wines outside of your comfort zone, like maybe a Cabernet Franc, be sure to sign up for my virtual tasting club, The Cork Crew. Use code WINE101 to get your first month absolutely free. Cheers! <laughs>